There are many beliefs and ideas that consume our culture. These beliefs guide and direct our daily lives, but not all of them are 100% true or beneficial to us. So how do we know which beliefs and ideas to buy into? As Christians, we want to go straight to the source, the Bible. That is our greatest truth, straight from the source. No additives, no preservatives, no artificial flavors. Well, welcome everybody. It's good to see you guys this weekend and welcome everybody uh, watching online and at our live sites. Thanks for being here as well. Uh, My name is Pastor Jeff. If I haven't met you, if you started coming or dialing in here the last few weeks, I have been traveling. And so uh, thanks for letting me do that. You um, may or may not know that Grace is a part of an international network of churches called the Karis Fellowship. And we have churches all throughout uh, the United States and all throughout the world. And uh, Grace Church of Greater Akron and our campuses uh, represent the largest church in that fellowship in the world. And so we have a lot of uh, conferences and things like that that we uh, help out with. And so you guys kind of loan us out to that network a little bit in the summertime. And we help to run youth conferences and conferences for pastors and connect with church planners and missionaries and things like that. And so thank you for doing that. And uh, thanks for putting us on loan. I was not on vacation. That's coming. So thanks for that too. Uh, but it's, uh, it's, that's what we were doing. So it's good to be home and it's always great to be back. It makes me more grateful uh, for you guys and what God's doing here. So it, it's, it's fun to, to reconnect. So if I haven't met you, I'd love to do that. And I uh, can say hi to you afterwards if you're here at, in the Gent Road building or if you're online, I'll see you at Discovery and I would love to meet you guys personally. I'm excited about kind of kicking off the fall because school starts, right? For a lot of us, school starts uh, next week or the next week. The children are like so sad. The parents are like so glad. And so we're right there. And so we kind of kick into what we call the ministry season, kind of that school year, and excited to do that and kind of get in those grooves. And we're going to start that with this series that we're talking about, uh, No Additives, No Preservatives, no artificial flavors. The reason we're uh, leaning into this idea <clears throat> is because there's so many thoughts and ideas out there about Christ and Christianity and the Bible and faith. And we thought it's important. It's important sometimes. It's not the first time we've done this and it won't be the last, but sometimes it's important that we stop and say, hey, because these ideas have so much volume and because they're kind of a part of our lives, social media, all that kind of stuff. It's important to go back and kind of source uh, again sometimes certain ideas and make sure that we press into the Bible, we understand exactly what Christ said, exactly what the apostles said, exactly what Orthodox Christianity is. So when, the, when Christ, the Bible, the, the, the church over history, kind of what we believed at the core, and it helps to clarify. It helps to clarify ideas. It helps us to clarify what truth is. It even helps us to to lead other people to that truth. So we're going to do that for the next few weeks. And we're going to talk about uh, ideas like this. Like we'll start this weekend with salvation. Like how do we receive salvation? Why do we need it? Where does it come from? And that's an important truth to have locked in. Next week we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit. And who is the Holy Spirit? Do you you have to get baptized? Do you have to speak in a tongue? Like what does it mean to have the Holy Spirit and to have God live in you like that. We're gonna talk one week about the purpose of God and the purpose of man, right? So <clears throat> it's a big idea. Does God exist for me or do I exist for God? And like my perspective on that is a very, very big deal. Is God's purpose and his existence to make my life go the way that I want it to go? Or is my purpose to respond to how God leads me regardless of circumstances? That's a big deal, and it really affects how we kind of interpret God and interact with him. And we're going to talk about one week about how the fact is that Jesus was fully God and fully man while he was on earth. And that's a big concept. It's a theological idea. 
It's a fascinating one, but it's important. Uh, there's a big movement out right now that almost all of us are exposed to in one way or another called the prosperity gospel. And one of the things that a big part of that movement would teach, and even some big churches in that movement would teach, is that when Jesus came to earth, he set aside his deity. So he was not fully God while on earth. What he was was filled with the Holy Spirit, like you and I are if we're Christians. So that's why then when Jesus says something and it comes true, it's why you can also name something or declare it out loud and it will come true in your life is what they would teach. Well, that's a big deal. And is that true? And if you took it back to the Bible, is that what God's word actually says? <clears throat> and then we're gonna wind up this series by just talking about healing. And when you see a guy on YouTube or Snapchat or something like that, and he's healing somebody on the street, or you see that happening, is that what God meant by that? Is that does God give like special powers to certain people? Or is there something else that God was accomplishing through healing and wants us to understand about that too? So those kind of things. We'll just talk them through. And we're not really, we're not bashing anybody or trying to nail anybody, nothing like that. We're just like, let's just go back to the source and see what the Bible actually says. Because these ideas are kind of swirling around and we all kind of interact with them one way or another. And uh, sometimes in the Christian community, sometimes just in our culture, like it's, a, it's an idea, a preconceived idea about who God is and who he's not. And if we looked and said, well, what does God say? What did the apostles say? What has the Orthodox Church always believed? We went to the core of Christianity. Then, then you start to understand this stuff a little bit more. And it's nothing new. It's, it's not like a 911. There's always been like additives and preservatives and artificial flavors that have been added to the core of Christian teaching. Uh, and, the, and the church has always kind of gone back to its, its core again and again and again. Some of these additives and preservatives and artificial flavors are old and we're familiar with them. Uh, things like, you know, you gotta be baptized as a baby to go to heaven. Well, you won't find that in the Bible. It's not there. Uh, priests or pastors can't marry. They have to be celibate their whole life. It, you won't find that in the Bible. It's not there. I've looked and my wife and our seven children decided that that's, I'm good, right? So like, <clears throat> it, it's not there, but it's familiar to us. And we're like, well, it's, it's just not there if, if you look at it. And that's some, the old ones. Some things are very new and they're, they're new and kind of in the chronicles of history. So you get into things like the prosperity gospel and that uh, Jesus came to make you healthy and wealthy and happy, you won't find that in the Bible. In fact, that teaching really was not predominant until about the 1920s or 1930s. It's very new. And it kind of took root because it agrees with our Americanism a little bit. But when you read the Bible, Jesus is like, yeah, if you follow me, you'll be persecuted and people will hate you and try to kill you for it. Like it says the exact opposite. You get into big religious ideas like Mormonism as an example. It's a very new thing, 100, 125 years old. It doesn't have a lot of history. And when you look at its roots, you look at its understanding and look at the additions that it brings, you're like, man, that, that actually doesn't line up with God's word at all. So you just source that stuff, right? You go back into it and, and you look at it. And then some stuff is just really new and really wacky, like God is genderless. Nobody's ever thought that ever until like four years ago, okay? Uh, universalism, uh, the, I, the whole idea of like coexisting, all paths lead to heaven, that, that's, a, that's an ancient thing that's being, been reinvented 35, 40 times over, over the centuries. And so it's just a part of our lives now, but... But it's not in the scripture. It's not even related to Christianity at all. And it's never Christianity, true Christianity, that's woven that in. It's some other group that's woven Christianity into that. So just stuff like that, that once in a while, these are just a part of our world. Like it's not that big of a deal to see a coexist bumper sticker on somebody's car. But what does it mean? And what does the Bible say? And how do we interact with that? And why is that important? And we're just gonna take these subjects for the next few weeks, there's a gazillion more we could look at, but we just felt like these were kind of prompt, predominant ones, and go back to the source and say, let's push all this other stuff aside. What's, what does the Bible actually say? What's at the core of it? And let's investigate that and understand it together. So I think it's going to be enlightening and exciting and good and helpful, and I think it's a great way to kind of kick off our ministry year together. This weekend, what I want to do 
is I want to start at the very core of it all, right? So if we were going to look at Christianity and even look at faith systems, and we were going to get to the very, very, very core of, of those systems, and even Christianity, we would look and we would start with the concept of salvation. So what is salvation? Why did God want, why does he want to save me? What am I being saved from? If we're talking about going to heaven or not going to heaven, eternal life or not eternal life, like what is that all about? That is at the core of Christian teaching. <clears throat> I want to talk through that whole idea. What's God doing? Why is he doing it? What, how does he want us to respond to him? What does that mean? And how do we interact with that? Okay, so we'll kind of start at the beginning and uh, start digging at this a little bit. So let's talk about salvation. When we talk about salvation, we have to start actually not with us. We have to start with God. And when we start with God, we first have to start with this idea of why. What motivates God? What's his intention? What's his desire? How does he view us? And what is his motivation toward us, right? Now, let me say this. If I could somehow control the world for just, I don't know, five minutes, like I've been praying about this, but so far, no good. So, but if I could control the world for five minutes and I can control everybody's minds and thoughts for five minutes, there's two thoughts that I would give everybody on the planet that they would accept as true. The first thought is this, Michigan is evil and it's of the devil. That would be thought number one. Here's the second thought, ready? I would implant in your brain God loves you and you can trust him. If I could get everybody on the planet to believe that, that's what I would do with my superpower. God loves you and you can trust him. And when you think about salvation and think about what God says about himself and what he says about us, if I can interpret that information through the lenses of God loves me and I can trust him, then all of that will make sense to me, right? So I wanna show you this because this is actually what Jesus says. He says, I love you and I can trust you and you can trust me and my motives for interacting with you, for talking about your soul, talking about your sin, talking about salvation, come from love. I'm not out to get you, I love you and I want to give you Something. So if I was looking at, a, at like a key passage, like sum this up, I would go, and in fact, I'm going to take you there to John chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. So John 3, 16 is probably the most famous verse in the Bible. Many of us might be kind of at least exposed to it. It says this, it's Jesus' words, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not have perish, shall not perish, but have eternal life. When I'm looking at that passage, I would look and say, when you're reading that, I want you to zero in on the, first, the fourth word of this sentence. For God so loved the motivation behind God's interaction with humanity is his love. He loves you. He is not out to get you. He would have gotten you by now, right? He knows what you did this summer. So God loves you. This is huge. And if I can begin to understand God and his interaction with me through that lens, that he loves me. He did not come to wag his finger at me. He did not come to trip me up. He did not come to put rules on my life. He did not come to cage me in. He did not come to make me feel guilty. He did not come to make me feel shame. God loves me. And his love for me caused him to do something. And what it caused him to do was to give his only son, Jesus, so God looked at us and says, I love humanity, I love you, and it's gonna move me or motivate me to an action, what action? To give my one and only son, and if you know the story, over to the cross. And by the way, Jesus loves you and was motivated to obey his father, even obedience unto death. So Jesus is not a sacrificial, like, you gotta go do this, son, kicking and screaming. Jesus is a willing participant in this plan. So the love of God 
is so powerful and dynamic that it triggers an action from God that ultimately leads to Jesus laying his life down on the cross. He loves us, and so he gave his son. And then verse 17, I think, is one of the most important verses in the whole Bible because it clarifies God's intentions. He so loved the world, he gave his one and only son. Verse 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Jesus didn't come to condemn you. He didn't come to wag his finger at you. I saw you smoking and drinking and chewing. Mm. He didn't come to set up a bunch of new rules for you. He didn't come to constrict your life. That is not his motivation, right? So something is going on with God. When God looks at humanity and looks at you individually, what fires in him is love and then that love drives a very strong response of sending and giving his son. And the, Jesus is like, and by the way, I didn't come to get you. I came to, the Bible uses words like this, save us, rescue us, ransom us, free us. God looks and says, I see humanity, I love humanity, and humanity's got a problem. And the problem is so deep and powerful that they are trapped. They are, the Bible uses the word enslaved. They're, they're spiritually dead. Something's going on in them, and I love them, and it's going to cause this dramatic of an action on my part to give my son, for the son to go, not to condemn but to save the world. Now, this, this is a curious thing. This is a curious thing. Because when I think about myself as a human being, I don't think about my spiritual condition in those dramatic of terms. I, when I look at myself, I don't see anything so wrong with me that the creator of the universe has to give his only son to die for me. I don't think I'm that bad of a person, right? If you said to me, Jeff, I'm a good, I'm a good person, I would look at you and I'd say, I bet you are. I mean, you got up on a beautiful weekend, came to church. How bad can you be, right? I'm a good person. If you looked and said, well, I, I'm a sincere person. I sincerely believe or I sincerely want to do good. I would look at you and I'd say, I bet you are. I am too. I'm a sincere person. I don't have like nefarious motives. I'm not trying to trick anybody. I'm not trying to like scar the planet. I recycled a can one time. Like, like, I, like I, I don't wanna be like that. I'm not like that. I wanna leave the world a better place. I'm not a particularly selfish individual, right? Not worse than anybody else. So I view myself as good and I view myself as well-intentioned and God looks at me and he loves me and he gave his only son to die for me. Seems like there's a disconnect there. Because I don't feel like I need to be died for, but God does. Well, why? Why? So the Apostle Paul says this. He diagnoses the problem for us. He says this in Romans chapter 3, verse 23. He says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. For all have sinned. Raise your hand if you're an all. Raise your hand if you're an all. all if you're not raising your hand, then there's something dramatically wrong with you. If you're an all. So all have sinned. Me, you, everybody. We're, I'm an all. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. What is the glory of God? The glory of God is the nature or the character of God. It's the righteousness of God, the holiness of God. The way that I would use a, kind of a modern word for it is I would say the perfection of God. God is perfect. By the way, we want God to be perfect. We need God to be perfect. So the glory of God, the perfection of God, the sinlessness of God. So I'm in all. And all have sinned and fall short of the perfection of God. When God looks at humanity, he says, I love you guys. And we say, well, I'm a good person. I'm a sincere person. God might even look at you and say, I agree with that. That's just not where I'm at. 
My, my standard is not goodness. My standard is not sincerity. My standard is perfection. I'm perfect. You're imperfect. And perfection and imperfection cannot coexist with each other. If something is perfect, it doesn't matter how small the imperfection, if an imperfection is applied to perfection, the, the perfect becomes imperfect. The standard is the glory of God, not the goodness of man. And if, if you want to be with me, you have to be perfect. I love you. I want to be with you. But I need you to be perfect, to be in my presence. So Paul says this is the problem. For all, I'm an all, have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We all have sinned. A sin is anything that is not perfection, is not to the standard of the glory of God. So we all have sin. Who in here has ever told a lie? Raise your hand. If you're an all, you've told a lie. Who's ever been selfish? Raise your hand. If you're an all, you've been selfish, right? Who's ever had a wrong motive? Raise your hand. If you've, who's ever had a lustful thought? Raise your hand. If you, you chickened out. You completely, you're on a roll. You chickened out, right? Who's ever committed a crime? Raise your hand if you committed a crime. Who's ever been rightly convicted for that crime? Raise your hand and, again. You're chickened out, right? So in, in what, 15 seconds? We all agreed that we're an all, and we all agreed that we sinned. And we would look at that and say, well, God, that's not that big of a deal. And God's like, yeah, it is. Because it's not about goodness, it's not about sincerity, it's about the glory of God, the perfection of God. God. And the apostle Paul goes, he goes on and earlier. He says this, he says that we all know this, right? There's no one righteous, not even one. We all know that. There's nobody perfect, not even one. There's no one who understands. We all know that. Nobody has the mind of God. We know that we don't have the mind of God. There's no one who seeks God. There's no one, nobody that can say with all sincerity and impurity that I live my life completely for the glory and the love of the father. Nobody, everybody knows this. That's not true. I'm in all, I'm sin. And God is perfect, and I am imperfect, and I have a problem. I have a problem. Because when God looked at me and so loved me and saw me in my imperfection, he recognized something that I don't tend to recognize in myself. He recognized that my sin separates me from God. And that separation is spiritually fatal. If I move through life, and certainly from this portion of my life to the spiritual, the eternal portion of my life, to death, that it, it, I'll be, it's spiritually fatal for me to be separated from God. And so God's sending of a son is not an overreaction. My concept of my sin is an underreaction. Paul says it this way. He says the wages of sin is death. Wages is what I earn for what I do. Wages is what I earn for what I do. If, if I work for an hour in the yard, I might earn 10 bucks. Wages is what I earn for what I do. And so Paul says, what you earn for your sin is spiritual death. Am I an all? Am I a sinner? We all just said we were in. And what do I earn? What does my sin earn me? Because I sin on accident. I sin on purpose. I lie on purpose. I steal on purpose. I lust on purpose. We all do it. And what I earn for what I do or my wages, the Bible says that those wages equals death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus our Lord. The Bible says your wages have to be cared for. Your wages have to be cared for. You've earned them. And the gift of God is Jesus Christ the Lord. Jesus stepped out of heaven. He came to earth fully God and fully man. He lived a 
perfect life. Jesus never sinned. He gave his life. Jesus was not murdered on the cross. He laid his life down. He is like a, a soldier that jumped on a grenade or a police officer that got between a gunman and a child or a firefighter running into a burning building. He gave his life. And then he took it up again by his own authority. He rose again from the dead. And the Bible says that when he did that, he created a gift for us. He created a way for our sins, our wages to be paid. It's called, the, the fancy word for it is the atoning sacrifice. The atoning sacrifice just means this. Jesus paid a debt he didn't owe for those of us who owe a debt that we cannot pay. God looked and says, I love them, but they're racking up the spiritual debt, the wages of their sin. They don't even understand how bad they're racking up their spiritual debt. And they cannot pay that debt. It doesn't matter how good you are, you can't be perfect. It doesn't matter how well-intentioned you are, you can't be perfect. It's impossible. And that debt is out of control. And I want to be with them, but I'm perfect and they're imperfect and we cannot coexist with each other. Somebody has to pay that debt. I am a just and holy God. I, it has to be paid. I will give my son, who because of his innocence has the right and the authority and the ability to pay a debt that he doesn't owe, for people who owe a debt that they cannot pay. And he, on the cross, will allow my wrath or justice to be poured out on him. And this is exactly what Peter says Jesus did. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, we have been healed. Jesus, when he went to the cross and when he suffered and when he died, all of your wages for sin were paid by Christ. It's a gift. You can't earn that. There's no way you could earn that gift. There's no way you could pay for that gift. It's a gift that has to be given. It has to be a gift. So Christ bore those sins or paid for that sins once for all on the cross. And in doing so, he creates forgiveness that's available now to you and I. We're able to be forgiven because of what Christ did for you and I. Okay. Now, that's a big deal. God is who he says he is. Christ is our substitutionary atonement. Paid a debt he didn't know for those of us who owe a debt we, that we couldn't pay. I need that to happen. I need to be rescued. I need to be ransomed. I need to be forgiven. I need a way of escape. I'm actually an all and a sinner. And Christ did it. They were my wages that he paid for me. And that, that is the essence of the doctrine of salvation. And there's one step that's missing. It has to be a gift. And a gift has to be received. If I'm trying to give you a gift that you can't afford, and I offer it to you and you say, well, I'll earn the money. You'll never earn the money for this. Well, I'll work it off. You can't live long enough to work this off. It, it has to be a gift, and the gift has to be received. And it's usually at that point of tension that I find that we struggle. We, we struggle to believe that at the very, very, very core of salvation, that God is giving us something that we need and that we don't deserve and that he didn't attach a price tag to. It's a free gift. What I found over the years is this, that how we interpret God directly affects how we interact with his gift. How we interpret God directly interacts how we interact with his gift. And this is where artificial flavors and preservatives come in, where this other stuff gets added to it 
And it causes us to try to get that gift in a way that God says you, you can't. You have to receive it from me. So things like this, this is kind of how we say it here at Grace. We find that a lot of times we view God as an inspecting God. And we find that that's an artificial flavor. It's a preservative, right? It's something that's, it's an additive. That God's an inspecting God. That God is looking and, and he's looking for you to do certain things to earn the gift. I was raised in a, in a church like that where God was an inspecting God. And what they would say is some version of Jesus loves you and died for you and you better live up to it. You better live up to it. And you better stop smoking and drinking and chewing and dating girls who do because God is watching you. He's always, he's always watching you, <laughs> right? And if he finds out that you're not living up to the gift you may not even get it. So you better knock it off and you better get your act together and you better stop it. And so you would go to church every week and a new sin would be brought up that you're to work on that week. And that's how that worked. And if you didn't pass those tests and you didn't live the way and check off the boxes that they told you to check off, then you may, not, you may or may not get the gift. Nobody really knows. Because of God's inspecting God. And what happens is this. If I hear God that way and I interpret God that way, then I will believe that additive. And I will believe that I get my salvation by cleaning my life up. And the more I clean my life up to the degree that I clean my life up, and if I clean my life up in the right area, then God has to save me. Surely that proves that I'm worthy to purchase the gift. Many of us were raised that way. And we were taught. And, and so what we'll do is, the church word for it is we'll become legalist. We'll, we'll keep the rules right and that will cause us to receive the gift. And we believe that's the way that you receive salvation because many of us were raised that way or taught that way or have that idea about the church. If you, if people are Christians if they don't do X, Y, and Z. See. Another way that, that an additive, a preservative artificial flavor that's often added to this idea is that God is a disappointed God. Is how we say it here. God's a disappointed God, right? A disappointed God is this mindset. I saved that one, but man, I kind of regret it. <laughs> I guess I'm stuck with them because I can't go back on my word of God. I can't lie, unfortunately, right? So God's a disappointed God. And, and that was my upbringing a lot in church. That, that I, I, would, I would go to church and, and I would get a sin. You get a new sin every week to work on. And so I would get a sin to work on and then I would leave and work on that sin and I'd come back and find out it wasn't good enough. Oh, that was just the first sin. So like secular music was a big deal at our church. You weren't allowed to listen to secular music. If you don't know what secular music is, it's almost all good music. And so you weren't allowed to listen to it. And so I would go to church and you would, you would hear about secular music. And so you wanted to follow God. So you would go and you would throw out all of your cassettes, all of your Def Leppard, all your Led Zeppelin, all your Garth Brooks, all the good stuff. Church of Yearwood. Like the whole nine years. Like you, you would throw it out, right? So all over Beaver Creek, Ohio, there are shattered cassettes that came out of my worship of God out the car window. And so I would hear all that and I would feel good. I'd be like, oh man, I, I passed inspection. God's going to be pleased with me. I did it. I go back into church and they'd be like, great. Last week was secular music. This, th this week, this week is now there's something else. Well, what is it this week? Well, you're not allowed to worry. What? Yeah, you're not allowed to worry. Matthew 5 says, don't worry. Are you a worrier? Well, I don't know. I'm worried about it. Well, you should worry. But I can't believe you. You, you got to stop worrying. Don't you know you got to worry? The Bible says, don't worry, you worrier. And you'd be like, oh, smack. I got to quit worrying. So you go home and you work on not worrying the whole week. And then you come back and you're like, did you stop worrying? I think I did. I'm not sure. Try not to worry. I'm a little worried about it. But like you would do all that, right? And then you get another one. What is it this week? Well, this week it's lust. You gotta stop lusting. You gotta stop thinking about naked people. Oh, smack. You, 
Men, I say naked people, you think about naked people. Everybody in this, everybody in the world that's listening to me right now is thinking about naked people. And you're like, don't think about naked people. You're like, well, quit bringing it up. And you're just back and forth. And you, you just realize, man, this won't stop. It won't go away. And every week that would happen. And the conclusion I came to in late high school and when I started college was, you know what? God's just an unpleasable father. You can't make the guy happy. There's always something else. See? And I have, I'll be honest with you, I got a little bit of a redneck streak in me. And, and the way that plays out is this. If I find out I can't make you happy, I just quit caring what you think. By the way, I'm that way as a pastor, too. It's horrible, but you need to know that. Don't complain too much. I just won't care anymore, right? I just don't care. I'm like, this guy's never happy. And so what happens is you give God, I call it your dutiful obligation. What do you want? You want me to go to church? I'll go to church. Will it shut you up? You want some money? I'll give you some money. We'll make you happy. You want me not to drink alcohol? Fine. No alcohol. Please now. And we'll look and say, well, that, that's how I receive my salvation then. You follow Christ? I go to church. Yeah, but do you, do you know and love and follow Christ? I don't drink. The last one we talk about is kind of a common one is this idea that God's a distant God, a distant God. And we call this the God of the cathedral, the God of the mosque, the God of the church building. God lives in holy places and you can only interact with him through holy people who know holy things. So you can't know God on your own, you can't worship God on your own, you can't follow God on your own, that person has to tell you what God says. Right? And if you were taught that or believe that, what happens is you become religious. Are you, do you know and love God? Yeah, I, I pray the rosary. Yeah, but do you know and love God? I take communion. But, but do you know and love God? I was baptized. And because we interpret God that way, we'll take God so loved the world and, and he gives us a free gift because the wages of my sin is death. And we'll look and say, I, I'll take the gift. I just don't believe it's free I'm going to earn it. If you give me a gift and I start making payments to you, it wasn't a gift, it was a contract. I didn't receive your gift. I'm trying to pay you for it. I don't even interpret it as a gift. And is that what that means? Or is that an additive or preservative? Is God an inspecting God? Are you, are you trying to say that God doesn't know I'm a sinner and I can't get my act together and that's, isn't that the point? That I can't produce righteousness myself, I can't be self-righteous? Doesn't the Bible say that while I was still a sinner, Christ died for me? Isn't that, isn't that the whole crux of the issue? Is God a disappointed God? Does a, does a God who's frustrated with you and have to put up with you, does that God say things like what Jesus said where he said, I'm no longer your master, now we're friends. Does, does that God look and say, when you ask for the forgiveness of my sin, you know what I do? I adopt you into my family. You're a son or a daughter of God. Does that sound like a disappointed God? Does, does a distant God who says, I'll never leave you or forsake you, I wanna walk with you, I sing over you in the morning, I enjoy you, I want to be with you, I wanna give you my Holy Spirit, my word and my church so that you can be more connected to me. Does that sound like a God that wants us to go and do the same thing one out of every five weekends and call it good? See, when you, when you source that, when you push that back in, none of that makes sense. None of it makes sense. And, and we're used to it. And for some of us, it might, it might seem like, the, you know, 
just the way I always do. And for some of us, it's certainly preconceived ideas about Christianity. But when you push it back into Scripture and Christ and the teachings and even the history of the church, it's not there. It's not there. The Apostle Paul does something wonderful for us as he's, as he's led. He looks at us and he says, guys, I want, I want to boil this down for you. And what he does is he, he leans into something that, that Jesus says. So let me clarify all this for you. So Jesus says this, right? Jesus says some fa- fascinating. These are his words. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus' words. I quote this all the time, but it's not my quote. It's Jesus' quote. So Jesus looks at us and he says, guys, I want you to understand something. If you boil salvation down to its very, very, very core, there, there's, there are years of conversations we could have about salvation. We're talking about its very, 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 very core. Jesus would look at you and say this. Salvation is about you and me. You and me. Do you believe that I am the way? I'm not one way. I'm not an option. I'm I'm not kind of out there with the great religions of the world. Do, Do you personally believe that I am the way? And you and me, you and me, do you believe that I am the way and the truth? that every other definition of salvation gets ruled out because I am the truth, singular. And the life, the spiritual life, for you to be resurrected from the spiritual dead and made spiritually alive, that I am that resurrection. Me, Jesus, only me. Do you believe that? And that when it, when it goes to the Father, he's perfect, you're imperfect. The only way to get to the Father is through me, my salvation, my fancy words, sanctification, justification. When, when God looks at you because you ask for the forgiveness from me of your sins, he doesn't see you, he sees me. And that's what allows you to interact with God because you do it through me. Do you believe that? Is that what you've chosen to lock into, not what they say, that said, that book, that author, that. What about you and me? Do you believe it? And at the core of our salvation, Jesus would boil it down to that. I love you. I didn't come to condemn you. I don't need to condemn you. You, You're an all and a sinner. You just condemned yourself. I don't need to reemphasize that point. But you are trapped and you need ransomed and you need a way of escape because you're an all and you're a sinner. And I came for you to do that. I I paid the debt. Have you accepted the gift? Now the Apostle Paul, kind of jumping off of that platform, says something fascinating that kind of sums all of this up in a way, at least our conversation today. He says this in the book of Ephesians, chapter two, verses eight and nine. He says this, for it's by grace. Grace is a very important concept. the, the, The academic definition of grace is unmerited favor. My favorite definition is the Ezra Wimberly definition that God loves you just cause. God just decided to love us. God so loved. But because I got my act together and other people didn't, nope, you can't get your act together. Because I'm religious and other people aren't, nope, uh, Jesus didn't actually get along with religious people that well. Because I've done enough good deeds, no, your righteousness is like filthy rags, like you're not even close. God loved you because, if I could get you to believe one thing, it's that, God loves you. I don't know why. Don't worry about it. He loves you. So it's by grace, the unmerited favor. God loves you just because. It's by grace that you have been saved through faith. Faith, 
Faith is choosing to believe what you cannot and will never fully understand. You decided to believe that. It's not because you're dumb. It's because you decided, I choose to believe what I cannot understand, and I know full well I'll never fully understand it. The greatest picture of faith is marriage, and a biblical marriage, an Ephesians chapter five marriage. It's a act of faith, how the Bible lays that out. So when Heidi and I got married, we put faith in a relationship. We got married, super simple to get married. I can marry in 10 minutes, easy peasy. I can do it shorter than that if you want. Super, it's a gift, it's a free thing. Getting married and being married are different things. So 26 years later, when Heidi and I got married, we didn't look and say, you've got to, if you can lay out for me in detail the next 26 years and beyond, it's impossible. We chose to believe in each other. It wasn't, here's all the answers, now I decided. It was, you and me, baby, let's go. And I don't know where we're gonna go over the next 26 plus years, but it, you and me, we're in it to win it. The good, the bad, and the ugly, it's you and me. It's faith. I chose to believe. Heidi chose to believe. Knowing full well that we could not know all those answers into our future, that's faith. Faith is I choose to believe. I choose to believe that Christ is who he says he is, that, Christ, that I am who God says that I am, that I need to be rescued. Well, answer all the questions. I can't answer all the questions. How in the world do you answer all the questions? It's impossible. I'm choosing to believe. I'm choosing to believe that God's grace, his love for me, and me accepting a gift that I don't even fully comprehend. I'm not dumb. I just understand that it's a step of faith. I choose that, that my salvation is there. This is not from yourself. It's a gift of God. It has to be a gift. You cannot earn it. You will never deserve it. It has to be a gift. Not by works, not by baptism, not by communion, not by the church, not by good works, not by a big check, not by a religion. It's not by works, it has to be a gift. And it was given by a God who loves you because he chose to love you. A God that did not come to condemn you because he doesn't need to condemn you. You're an all, you're a sinner. You raise your hand. By a, a God who looks and says, guys, you don't even, you can't even download the wages. But I did. And I love you. And so I'm giving you a gift. And when you try to earn it and try to buy a gift, it means you're not receiving a gift. When you try to earn it, you try to buy it, you think that you're somehow worthy of it. But if you would just receive it, embrace it, enjoy it, at the very, very, very core of salvation, that's what the Bible teaches. That's how God's responding to us, what God wants to see about ourselves, and how he wants to interact, wants us to interact with the gift that he's given. I got a, a call from a, a friend who was dying, and uh, the family called, and they want to talk to a preacher, so I qualify. And so I went to talk with him. I sat down with him, and, and we did a little chit-chat. And, and he, he basically looked at me, and he, go, he goes, all right, preacher, make your pitch. Okay. <laughs> I'm like, I'll make my pitch. And I said, I said, I assume we're talking about, like, your soul and salvation, life after death, things like that. He's like, yeah, make your pitch. I'm like, okay. So I made my pitch. And so we talked about everything that we just talked about here th this weekend. And I talked to him about all that for a while. And I said, you know, it boils down to faith and, and God loves you and wants to give this gift to you, but it has to be received. And, and that's how we receive salvation. And so we talked, I don't know, 45 minutes about all that. 
And he, uh, we got to the end of it. He goes, you're good preacher. I said, well, I'm professional, you know, I take pride in my pitch. And so I said, that's all good. I said, what do you think about all that? And he said, well, you know, he goes, you, you said a lot there. He goes, I got a question for you. I said, okay. He goes, you know, I hear what you're saying. I've never been able to completely understand evolution and creationism. Because you say that you believe the world was created by God and I see all this science. I've never been able to put those two things together. I said, okay, it's fair enough. You know, it's a great question. He goes, and then I have another question for you. I said, okay. He goes, what's the deal with the Old Testament? I mean, God's always smiting somebody or giving somebody some leprosy or something like that. God seems harsh in the Old Testament. I don't get the Old Testament and these miracles. I mean, was Noah a metaphor? Was he literal? I just don't know. Can you get that many animals in an ark? I just don't know. I don't know what to do with that. I said, okay, you know, that's, that's a great question. And he goes, and then there's, there's, the, there's the whole thing of if God's a loving God, why is there evil and pain in the world? I mean, if God's all powerful, why doesn't he just take all that away? That doesn't make any sense to me. What about these kids in Syria and, and this and that? And he, and he said, I just don't know what to do with that. And I said, okay. I said, those, those are fair questions. And I looked at my friend. I said, you know, those are really fair questions. And I have answers I would give you for that. I don't think any of them will fully satisfy them because some of these things are, are mysteries that we'll never fully understand. And so we can talk about it. And it's not just a mute point for me, but is that really why I'm here? And I looked at him, we, get, we, we actually became very good friends. I looked at him, I said, you're dying. Am, am I here to talk about the philosophy of evil in the world? I mean, is that, or are we talking about your soul? I mean, I'll sit and talk. But is that the subject we're going to go with? Fair enough, preacher. And so we talked a little bit more. I prayed. And I said, I'll come back, hang out with you whenever you want. And so it took off. A few weeks later, I got a phone call. Family said, you know, he's, he's bad. He's bad. And we think a time short, will you come back? So I said, sure. And so I went back and I went to him. And he was, he had a breathing tube in and stuff like that. And and uh, I said, hey, bud. And I called him by his name, and I said, hey, I said, um, did you ask me to come out here because you know you're going to die soon? And he had a breathing tube in because he, he couldn't really talk well, so, but he was fully alert, so he, he nodded his head. Okay. Are you thinking about what we talked about, about who Christ is, who you are, what to do? I said, are you worried about your soul? You worry about whether you're going to go to heaven or hell? Okay. I said, do you remember this whole? And I said, do you want to put your faith in Christ? And I said, I called him by his name again. I said, I know, like, you got all these questions. And they're, they're, Good enough. I mean, they're legit. They're, they're fair questions. But do you, I just want to be clear, are you choosing to believe? Knowing you don't fully understand, there's nothing weird about that or simplistic or unintelligent. Are you choosing to believe? Okay. I said, how about we do this? How about I pray? Because I know it's hard for you to talk. It hurts you to talk. So what if I use words, and if you agree with those words, you use them in your heart, and you talk to Jesus? You want to do it that way? I said, okay, let's pray. Jesus, here's my friend. He doesn't have all the answers, but he wants to trust you. Jesus... I believe that you're God. Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I need rescued. Jesus, would you forgive me of my sins? And would you rescue me even though I don't know what to do? Amen. I looked at my friend. I said, did you, did you copy that prayer? Is that, did you mean it? 
I said, okay. We wrapped up and closed up. I looked at him and I said, I said, God loves you. I want you to see this. And he chased you to the verge of eternity. Because I've been a pastor for over 26 years now. I've led two people to Christ on their deathbed, and he's one of them. It's one of the rarest things. That, that does not happen. Either people are unable to respond or they're, they're, they've made up their mind a long time ago. It's a, it was this incredible act of mercy from a loving God. And I talked to his family. I said, you guys see, yeah, we see that. See, God chased him to the end. Right? He died about 12 hours later. And I believe with everything in my soul that I will interact with him in heaven, that he's with the Lord right now. Right? I want you to catch this. At the very, very core, this man acted on faith and received the grace of God. He was never baptized. He never took communion. He never read his Bible. He never came to church. He never gave a nickel. He never did one good deed in Jesus' name. At the very, very core, see, most of those things are relational responses. After the wedding, Heidi and I started working on being married. At its very, very core, it is salvation by grace through faith in Christ alone. That's it. And he received that. It's all he could do. And he confessed his sins. And God was faithful and just and forgave him of his sins and cleansed him from unrighteousness. Right? Now I wonder if you have done that. I was baptized, I took communion. That, that stuff's great. I was baptized as a baby. You were baptized as a baby because your mom and dad loved you. And they were, they were taught that. It, that. There's nothing nefarious about that. It's not, in the, it's not in the Bible, though. It's just not. I was raised in the, You were raised in the church because your mom and dad loved you. They were doing the best they could. It's not in the Bible. It's not. Have you, on your own, said, Jesus, I choose to believe that you're God. I agree, I'm an all, I'm a sinner. Would you forgive me? Right? I want to receive the gift. And would you ask Christ for the salvation that he died to provide for you? So this is what I want to do this weekend. I want us to pray together. And if you're watching online or one of the live sites, I want you to, to join me in this. I want you guys to kind of pause. And so we're going to pray. I want, I want to have the band play this song. And the song is reflective, and it's a, it's a truth, and it can be a prayer. So even if you're watching online, just be still for a minute. Pray, listen to this. Then afterwards, I'll come back up and like wrap up our conversation. But this is what I want you to do. As you're praying, if you've never prayed that prayer and you want to, and you really believe it, you've chosen to, then pray it. It's salvation, right? And ask Christ to forgive you and cleanse you and begin that relationship with him, okay? So let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Pray to God, don't worry about your words. God doesn't care what you say, he cares what you mean. And let's listen to this song, sing it, pray it if you want. Do this online too if you're watching and then I'll be back up and we'll wrap up, okay?